Uh, John, thank you very much. That was really great to, to hear that. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions if people have any questions. And I have one question off the top of my head. Um, you talked about just laying down symbols on the canvas. Do you have certain motifs that you seem to go to over and over? Are they symbols that have some kind of anchor in reality or are they just kind of shapes and symbols that you kind of come up with your own um, artistic language? That's a good question. Um, you know, initially, initially when I, when I stumbled upon the oil pastels and wanted to incorporate that medium into my work, there was really not much thought behind it it but the more that i did it the more i, I started looking at that um, that aspect in my work and even that medium in my work as really a personal thing meaning you know almost looking at it more like calligraphy and more like handwriting and so that kind of got my mind thinking that you know instead of random things which there are i mean a lot of my work is random in a way, but I think a lot of it is subconscious. But there, I, I began to see that there were certain things that I found myself repeating. And sometimes I, I could figure out why that was and I could understand that. But then other times, um, I'm not sure where it came from, but I would find myself, you know, repeating that throughout different works. And so to me, that was interesting um, because I have always thought that well, this kind of harkens back to the illustration days. You know, I had always thought that there should be a reason for everything that you're doing. But what I've come to realize is sometimes there is a reason, but you may not even know what that reason is. And, and a lot of times that's probably better not to even to worry about that or to think about that. You know, I think that's where you start to see uh, an individual in, in their work. Yeah, great. I hope people have a lot of questions because <laughs> I feel bad just I do. rambling I on. A, okay, good. Got, a lot of questions. Peter always has a lot of questions. I, I've sure. got a, a, a couple of comments and then some questions, but I think it's interesting because you're about the third person that's, uh, it's interesting that similar backgrounds, because I know Anna, she probably will talk about this. She was in illustration and graphic design, kind of went through the same thing. Don Gray, who's not with us on this today went through a similar transformation he did very realistic stuff and then got into abstract in these kind of both ways so i find that really interesting is a uh and i i'm going to share the recording of this with a local group of local artists that i i have a group with half of them are representational artists and they always say i don't understand abstract art i don't understand and, and i think you just nailed it in terms of you don't know, here just try this or this here's a step by step of how it could happen or, or it doesn't, because if you've ever, well, you guys, you've been in the Northwest or Northeast, it's a lot of paintings of bridges and loons and uh, foxes, uh, lots of stuff like that up here, which there's, you know, that's fine. But they, a lot of these people is kind of, uh, they wish that they could go further. And so I think it was great to, to see that you, and then talk about it, that you kind of went through that step by step. And then you ended up, because being an abstract painter myself, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it, you it's almost frightening how much freedom you have so you almost have to build your own guardrails and say okay these are the rules that i'm setting for myself because otherwise it's just a big scary blank canvas so that, that thanks for that i thought it was great um my question is uh, i guess one one of my questions is who are the artists that because before we got on you started mentioning some some artists that you really like who are the artists whether well known or not well known that that you admire and that you that have kind of informed your work i think because you know, i can see certain things but i i would like to hear it from you ah oh, that's interesting um you know initially <clears throat> initially uh back in the illustration days and even the figurative work days um i love the golden age of illustration you know uh nc wyeth and uh harvey dunn they were they were all you know, heroes of mine. I, I love that type of, you know, painterly, painterly work and the type of work that they did. So that was an influence early on. Um, you know, moving into the, moving into the um, 
fine artwork and the gallery work, you know, initially with the landscape, um, Maynard Dixon was a huge influence on the landscape work that I initially began to do. Um, he was also an illustrator back in the day, but um, I had always, and, and mainly it was the subject matter, I think, and his his simplicity and, and um, kind of the penchant for the way he designed and the way he created images of the desert was, it was a very big influence on me. Um, we actually even named one of our kids Maynard Dixon. <laughs> so yeah, I had to twist my wife's arm about that one. But anyway, so Maynard Dixon was a huge influence with the landscape work and also people, you know, like a lot of the California impressionists like uh, uh, Edgar Payne and, and uh, some of that, some of those uh, painters that were in the uh, northern and southern parts of California. As far as the <clears throat> abstract work, um, you know, I, I was always, you know, it, it's funny because I've, I've gone through that transitional thinking and, and uh, Peter, you touched on this a little bit with, you know, and, and I found this when I would be with other artists that were academic artists and stuff, we would have discussions all the time about, you know, realism versus abstract and stuff. And, and a lot of people had very polarizing uh, opinions on that. And I could never really, I never really understood that because I always looked at any work, you know, I would always look at it for design and color and, and energy and stuff like that, you know. So to me, I was always a little bit conflicted when I would hear, you know, academic painters like, I don't even understand this abstract work and, you know, it makes no sense to me. And obviously they can't draw or can't paint and things like that. You know, then I would hear from the other side of, oh, all these academic painters, all they do is copy things and, you know, there's no feeling or inspiration in it. And, and so that was always interesting to me to, to hear that and, and uh, try to make sense of that. Even when I would look at abstract work, you know, I was looking at it from, from that perspective. But as far as the abstract influences, um, I, I don't, you know, uh, trying to think if there's anything, I've always tried to shy a little bit away from, um, I don't know, how do you say it? I mean, I, I, I never, with the illustration work and with the landscape work, you know, I was always looking at other artists and seeing what they were doing. And, and part of that was a learning process. But what I noticed in that field also is that eventually a lot of those painters begin to look alike and so when I pushed into the abstract work that was something that I, I didn't want to go down meaning I wanted to try to do this solely on, on my own which you know as everyone knows that's created anything that that's impossible you're always influenced and you're always building upon what other people have done um, but really I think I would have to say like uh I don't know, Willem de Kooning, I loved his work, some of it, some of it I hate, some of it I, I love, and I think that probably goes with a lot of different, um, a lot of different painters, uh, um, Helen, uh, uh, Frankenthaler, Foster, yeah, Frankenthaler, love her work, um, uh, Deben Korn, I've loved his work, yeah. uh, and even a big influence color-wise in my work, I think that I see anyway is um, um, Rothko, Rothko's work. Sure. So I don't know if that really says. No, I, that, it, I think everybody, you have, you try, if some people, and I, I, I'm guilty of this, have certain things that I don't try to paint a certain way. I just kind of do it and it looks like somebody else's stuff. But I think the thing is you like certain things and I think that's the key and the trap that you might fall into, at least I think many of us do, is that you start to try to paint a certain way. And it's great to hear you say, that's not what I'm trying to do, but you do like those guys. I mean, this, and I think if you're an abstract painter and kind of a, with landscape background, those are the people, Deben Korn, Rothko, yeah. uh, De Kooning, Cy Twombly, the, all of those guys are, you're, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna come out, but um, well, good answer. I mean, it was, it's uh, it, always it's, interesting to hear. It's something that, you know, go, going from the background I had to where I'm at currently, and, and I never rule out anything. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, are you going to paint the landscape again? And how would you look at the landscape now? And this and that. And, and I don't know. That's always interesting. What I've noticed is that there are certain elements 
of what I did in the past that come creeping back into my work. Sure. Some of that lately has been figurative. Um, but <clears throat> the interesting aspect about it is, and sometimes I hesitate saying this because I have some views on, on teaching and workshops and, and things like that that I don't particularly like. And mainly they're for the reason of, I feel like I've had to unlearn so much of what I had learned. And, and that's, it's weird to say that because I even mentioned earlier, all that stuff is a foundation and it's a building block and it taught me everything that I think I needed to know, but now I'm learning and having to try to figure out how to undo that and change that. And does that make sense? So I, I, yeah, I think that, I think in a way, a lot of people, <clears throat> if they don't try to look at it that way, they, they get caught into, you know, doing things one way. I mean, one thing that, that I try to do is, is almost never start something the same way I've started something before. I mean, like when I go to pick out, when I need to do a paint order, I usually just, instead of looking at my paints and saying, I'm low on this, I'm low on this or whatever, I just go onto the catalog and say, give me that, give me that, give me that, give me, you know? So I randomly pick colors, bring them into the studio, then figure out what to do with them. Good to hear. So, um, gosh, that such a parallel path you've had to mine, um, John. Very similar, very, very similar. I started out graphic design illustration, kind of fell into painting as a hobby. Hmm. And people started noticing what I was doing and wanted that stuff more, more than the illustration work. So that's kind of how it evolved for me. Um, but I'm particularly interested in how, you know, how you went from figurative to landscape, to abstraction, because I think it, when I look at your work, your, you know, and how I've followed you for the last couple of years, um, I actually see all of those influences definitely in what you're doing. I don't think we can get away from it. And so I'm a big proponent of saying everything, every place we've been and everywhere we've walked in life follows us you know, creatively into what we manifest. So I think that it's, it's kind of ridiculous to say in a lot of ways that, you know, you don't paint the landscape anymore, because I actually do see a lot of landscape influence in your work, in the way the shapes are organized. Um, the, the difference is, and this is something Peter's been playing with, is doing kind of a bird's eye view with his mapping and then also a forward landscape horizon line view at the same time. And that's, that's what I'm seeing in your work is that you've, it's like you've taken the landscape and the horizon line and you've just brought it forward onto the frontal plane and the way you organize your shapes. This, these are just observations based on, also, if you look at, Matisse, what he was doing figuratively, and then he flattened out perspective and put it straight across the plane. And so the, I see a lot of that in yours. And um, so I guess my, my biggest question for you is, um, I noticed that you, you talked a little bit about your symbols and how you don't really have a vocabulary that you rely upon, but I would say from my observation, I'd like you to flesh this out a little bit, is it feels like it, calligraphy and typography is always a big proponent of graphic design. Um, I did letterpress and calligraphy in college when I, in my training, so I know the, the curves and the arcs, letter forms still appear in what I do, so I would like you to flesh that out a little bit more and see if if you dive into yourself a little bit more in this conversation, if, if this, these symbols and this symbology does have reference in typography, um, even on a subconscious level. Definitely. Um, I would say initially, definitely. And, and some of that is um, in school, I took as many calligraphy class, classes as I could as well. I mean, I love calligraphy. So that, that was, that's obviously there. And the other thing is, um, 
you mentioned just with typography and design. I mean, in college, in college, we took several years of um, <clears throat> what we would call general, you know, where we were working with photography and, and interior design and uh, graphic design and illustration. And then after two years, we had to specialize and we had to apply to get into the to the program of what we wanted to do. And, and I went back and forth between graphic design and illustration. And at that point, I knew a lot more about graphic design than I did about illustration as far as how to make a living doing it. But I just, at that point, I, I remember that night before I submitted my portfolio, I, I just thought I need to just go with my gut and do what I think I would really enjoy doing. And so I applied for the illustration department. And once the uh, once the portfolio reviews were over, someone, one of the professors, had written on my on my application page, much better in graphic design. Should have <laughs> went that direction. <laughs> and I, I laugh at that, and I think, yeah, maybe he was right, but it's not what I really wanted to do. Um, but having said that, what I've come to what I've come to learn in the last thirty years. <clears throat> And sometimes I can't explain this as well, but <clears throat> that initial training and background to me was always initially how how to two things, figuring out one, how to make a, a pleasing design, a pleasing illustration or a pleasing painting. Hi, you know, when we're talking pattern design and color and all the elements of art or whatnot. And then secondly, finding a way to market that and to you know, sell it and to make a living off of it. Because I've always, from, from the first days of, of scraping by with illustration work until I, I got the freelance um, career up and running and stuff, I mean, it has always been, a lot of my drive has just been to survive and put food on the table, you know, and to, and to move forward. And so there was always that, okay, especially with the illustration work, how do you make a living out of that? What do you got to do? You know, how do I pound the pavement? How do I get art directors? How do I get jobs and stuff like that? And initially with the gallery work, it was the same way. That was my mindset, thinking the same thing is, okay, how do I make a pleasing picture? And how do I find these, you know, ways to create sellable work type of thing, figuring out that market. And I, and I think in a way, it was good and bad. It taught me a lot of things. I learned a lot of lessons, but I think it also... Uh, it also inhibited the work that I was doing. When I look back on that work, I can see a lot of it that it's it's good work and it was sellable work, I guess we could say, but there was something lacking in it and I could feel that personally all the time. And I think that's kind of what led me down the path that I ended up going down. But so what I mean by it inhibiting me is when I began to shift over into the abstract work, I still would have that one set of the mind thinking of, you know, what do I do with this, blah, 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 which if you're going to be a professional working artist, you, you know, you, you have to have that aspect. That's all there is to it. Either that or you're going to starve to death. But I've had to kind of push that away from me and, and, and try to figure out what, what I actually want to do or what I want to paint and what I want to get across with these paintings. And so I fight, I struggle with that all all the time and and what i've kind of found is and, and this kind of goes back to what you're mentioning anna with with images and things that are in my work for me and this is this is how it works for me and, and everyone will obviously be different or maybe there'll be some similarities but it's almost become like the less i think about my work the less i you know go over elements the less i try to flesh everything out ahead of time better I do <laughs> which I, I find myself in the studio all the time just saying just shut up just shut up shut up and just paint you know and if I can get to a point where I can tune it all out and just you know work on what's in front of you I feel that's when I do the the best work well that's a that's a great answer and I, I would like to just say a couple more things when before I knew where you were um, I always, I don't know why, I just always thought, well, he's got to be in Los Angeles, California. I mean, because I see a lot, to me, a lot of the symbols and the marks you make remind me so much of really well done graffiti. And so, mm -hmm. so 
having now knowing that you had the graphic design background like I did, uh, because in a way, typography and, and all of that that still pops up into my work, it's it's just a different form of graffiti. And it was that right. influence, that influence that that pops up. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I really gravitate towards your work. And now that I know your trajectory was very similar to mine. Mm -hmm. Because I could see you battling a lot of the same things um, that that I have, and and but have found your unique voice. I don't know if you have heard of an artist by the name of Andy Saftel, no. and he he's an artist. I think he was in Atlanta. I think he's he might have moved out west by now, and it's S A F T E L, Andrew Saftel or Andy Saftel. I would encourage you to to look at him um because he does really interesting symbology and hmm. work you know stuff in his work that i think would be and i know you don't like to you've said you don't like to look at other artists work and really think about it while you're working but i just think you might be interested in what he's doing so thank great. you great yeah i'll look him up yeah thanks thanks anna um john i'll say there's just one thing I, i'm sorry Alan. Is there one thing that I that I appreciate in one of your the photographs? So you're saying that you just and I agree. It's I understand when you say it's you just try not to think about it. But I noticed that you'd written the word contrast on the wall of one of the and I really like that. It was in one of the one of the pictures you'd written it because oh, oh. <laughs> I'm always telling myself there's not enough contrast or there's so it's like that subliminal thing to put it up there on the wall to say contrast. I like that. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, Julianne has a question. Yeah, I, I I just wanted to well thank you for for um for that presentation. It was really it was a really good a, a good way of of presenting in a chronological way and how your uh, how your style shifted and how so what I'm really interested in is that whole um, idea of the battle right uh, uh, which 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 you mentioned Anna that battle uh, uh, between you know what you're consciously what you've been taught what you're consciously um, um, aware of in the in the space and all the unconscious forces that play uh, including that whole idea about being terrified uh, um, uh, when you when you first find out that you're in fact really free to do whatever you want, and um, and that that shift from where you start, which is very controlled, and you know what you're doing, and it's very specific and it's very technical, and you know exactly what looks good, and you're you know to a, a space where um, everything is to be reinvented. I mean, everything is to be reevaluated in terms of what it has as a value in your in your painting um, um let alone a value on the market so 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 i was interested in how that you know how you relinquish control um um and 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 to me that's that's one of the um um because i was educated to be very intellectual about everything and very rationalistic and what i love about being in the studio is that i leave that behind and I leave that that whatever side of the brain that is like I don't want to hear it, and and I struggle to tune it out, but I don't want to hear it. And and I'm wondering how you, especially going into abstract art where you rely on that relinquishing of control. I would like to if you could speak to that um, when you're when you're in front of your painting. Like what choices do you make, and what choices do you let yourself? that you allow the the process to make does that yeah great that's um you're asking for the secret and i'm going to give it to you <laughs> <laughs> here's the secret um i'm going to go i'm going to start okay let's see uh, how can I'm, I'm trying to think how i can really succinctly put this out there um i realized through this whole process, this is what I've realized, is you can make a living, this is what I would tell myself, you can make a living creating paintings, okay? You can do that. If that's your focus, if you wanna create good, adequate, decent paintings and make a living at doing it, you can. 
And so initially, that's what I tried to do. Transitioning and, and watching just what was happening with my work, I began to realize, okay, maybe that's not what's important. Maybe that's not what I want to do. And so that's where that battle started. But to back up a step, I remember I was speaking to this one artist one time in, in their studio. I went and visited him. And he told me, he said, I'll tell you, and he, and he did this kind of tongue in cheek, but there's, there's, it's totally true. And, and I have no, you know, I, I never, ever want to uh, belittle anyone or say anything about what they create or what they do, because anything you choose to do that way, that's fantastic. You know, you want to be an illustrator, great. You want to do this, great, whatever, you know, be happy with it if that's what you want to do. So he said, I'll tell you right now, this is how you make a living as an artist. He said, find one or two artists that you like, that their work kind of resonates with you, paint very similar to them, you know, take a class from them, whatever, paint very similar to them, and then get a gallery in the same town that they have a gallery and charge half as much. <laughs> and it's I remember a thinking- It's a formula. It's the formula, well, right? Yeah. And it, and it works, you know, and I remember thinking, and, and he was saying this in, in, a, in a sarcastic way because it had happened to him several times, you know, in his career. And he was a little bitter about it, but whatever. But he was also truthful. If you want to make a living, you know, selling paintings, do that. And so there's that aspect of, okay, create a great painting, figure out the formula, you know, do that. So once now I'm getting to what, when I was getting to what I'm trying to figure out now, to me, it was um, trying not to even think that anymore. So you mentioned the struggle and the terrifying aspect of it. And it, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, you know, I tell myself, and this is maybe just as a comfort, but I try to tell myself in the back of my mind, um, the selling of the work is not up to you. You know, let your dealers, let the galleries deal with that or whatever, just create. But there's always that aspect of, well, in some way you have to create work that resonates with others, you know, for it to be sought after. But the caveat to that is if you're actually just focused on creating the work and, and expressing what you want to express, there's probably going to be an audience for that. You know, you're going to find that audience. So, what I try to do to forget those things is honestly, it, it's going to sound really, really weird, but I have to get in the right mindset and I have to, uh, to me, it's almost, almost in a trance like state in a way that I, you know, sometimes it's music and I love I always play music in the studio and most of the time I play it really loud because that helps block out you know, my voice is in the head and I have to actually get myself worked up into a state to paint. And it's so, you know, counterintuitive to what I used to do coming into the studio and, oh, I have this piece to work on and sit down and, you know, I know exactly what I'm doing. So what I'm doing now, I have to, I have to, I have to totally get myself into that zone or that state that I have no focus. And what I've done lately to kind of help myself with that is I've, I've started to look at each piece that I do, not as, not as a, not as a painting, not as a piece, like, okay, I need to work these things out and, and this and that. I'm, I'm beginning to try to look at each piece as an event <laughs> or an experience. And so what I've done is is I will try to get, I'll try to get pieces, you know, build up texture, I'll build up color, all these things with acrylic and whatnot, and then stretch the canvas. And, and to me, that's all just preliminary. I'm not, you know, whatever, put whatever color, do whatever you want kind of thing. But so I try to get the, the piece to a point to me that I call a beginning. So all the preliminary groundwork is done and it's beginning. And so then when I come into the studio, what I hope to do is one, get myself into that mindless zone because I used to always sit there and think, what do I have to say? You know, what am I doing? What is, what is this stupid kid from Reno, Nevada thinking he's a painter and what is he doing? And, you know, who's he fooling kind of thing? And uh, to, 
to get out of that and just focus on, okay, this piece in front of me, I'm going to look at it as an event instead of a painting. And so most of the time at that point, I try to finish a piece. I mean, I'll call it start, start to finish, even though, you know, I did all that groundwork and that preliminary work, but I want to attack that in one day, however long it takes me. And I want it to be the experience you know, that I had in the studio that day. And it will have to be what it's going to be. And what I've, what I'm beginning to understand with that is when I do that, then a lot of those marks and those shapes and um, those things that end up coming out on the canvas that I think are subconscious, they're actually what is part of me, you know? And so if I can get myself into that trance-like state, for lack of a better word, I, I got to figure out if anyone knows we can trademark a phrase or something, <laughs> but it's almost like if I can get there, then those things will come out and I'll have that experience will be what, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say. And there was an artist, a Canadian artist um, decades ago that said something I read <clears throat> what they wrote and it's very interesting to me. And this is part of the whole schooling thing is, you know, in school we're taught this, 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 all these art elements and stuff. And, but what this artist said was, <clears throat> Um, don't let your idiosyncrasies be erased. So he said, a lot of times, you know, with people that are, are, are fairly new to creating art and whatnot, you know, they're focusing on, uh, you know, composition and design and line and, and rhythm and, you know, all these elements of art or whatnot. And, and if they have an instructor or someone they're working with, it's always like, oh, well, don't do that. You know, this would be better over here. Or maybe you have a penchant for making tangents or whatever. Well, we got to eliminate those tangents and stuff. Well, what this artist was saying is, if you do that, you are losing what makes you you. You know, so if there's these weird idiosyncrasies that you have in your work, don't erase them, accentuate them, because that will make you an individual. It will make your work be your work. And so that's part of what I try to do also. Now I don't even know what you asked me. Did I even answer it? Did I even come close? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> because it's about, no, because it's about the, you know, it's about the conversation anyway. But I, I just noticed the vocabulary of of uh, war, I mean, or, or of battle, you know, that, that, that comes back, you know, what you have to do to put yourself in the state of, or, or, or to eliminate or to, um, so I, 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 I'm very sensitive to that, to that whole thing, because I, I feel like it's a, I do feel like it's a battle to, to resist some of the, some of the things that you, um, you know, that you've, that you've that you've been primed to actually right. do and to and to resist that when you're you know is a is is a battle and i like your idea of getting into the zone by you know by do having a process that's deliberate and then uh, uh putting the music loud and 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 getting into that to that to that space to that zone yeah no i i thank you for responding well we all know that that you can create great looking, you know, beautiful work, but it can be sterile and it can have no emotion and no feeling. And, and art to me is things that connect to us. You know, it's like a gut punch. It's like, oh, you see that work. And it's like, oh man, what, I don't know what that does to me, but it does something. So to me, it's like, okay, that's what I want to get to, you know? So when I dance in the studio and jump up and down and get all hyped up and that's because I'm hoping to get that out. Thank you. Um, and do you still have a question? You had your hand raised for a while. You still with us, Anne? Well, I was, yeah, I mean, um, I'm listening to just wonderful, you know, swirl around. And my question was sort of like, how do you feed the random? You know, because in some ways you don't want to become, I think we've answered all of this, but, you know, I'm saying, how do you, you can keep your idiosyncrasies, but when you're pulling from inside yourself, it's like, okay, you know, like I think what you said about breaking all these boundaries and, and getting outside and getting into a special zone um, keeps people from, keeps artists from becoming a little too recognizable 
or if you're going into yourself and you keep going to those same touchstones, um, you know, it, it, at some point, you know, I think you kind of have to, you know, drop kick yourself a little and say, okay, we've, we've, you know, this seems to be getting a little stale because you go back to it so many times. And yeah, I like what you said about just, well, I'm low on this color. No, go find some color you've never used before and, and mess with that. Um, you know, because I think that, and as you get older, you know, horrors, we're going to get old. But, uh, you know, the kind of the criticism of that is, well, you know so much that it might be a little hard to be fresh again. You know, you're, you're drawing off so much experience. You're going, all right, am I sticking to too narrow a path or, or is this becoming too predictable? And I mean, it sounds like you have a, a great um, a method for kind of getting around that, that you don't just sort of find yourself in that same spot, pulling up the same things. I think that I think that's a self-evaluation thing that takes a lot of practice. You know, I mean, it's I think if everyone is really honest with themselves, they they know when they've created something that speaks and they probably know when they create something that, that home, awesome. you know, I mean, it to me, sometimes I, I look at uh, I'll look at my work and think, man, what is wrong with you? Because your work, it seems like I go from here to here to here, you know, and, and I can't even most of the time put together a cohesive body of work from looking from the outside. I mean, to me, it all is, but to me, it's also every unique experience. Well, this day I felt this and maybe I wanted to say this and this day is this and this is, you know, that works for me. And that's how I, I try to keep things fresh with me, but there's still that, there still has to be that self-evaluation of looking at a, a piece or a body of work and saying, you know, did I phone that one in? or do I need to push it? Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat. We actually have someone from Bangkok, uh, Thailand joining us. Um, I'll, well, I'll just read the question. Uh, she says, I would like to ask if I want to go for abstract, should I start from drawing like not realistic? But to draw figurative or any representing objects first. Ooh, wow! Um, do, you, do you understand what she's asking? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I know how to answer that. Uh, um, there's a benefit to both. I mean, I think. I think drawing from life and figuring out how to draw from life and just doing it is a great exercise and it you know it trains your hand and eye visually um but there's also something about trying to create something you know randomly abstract drawing i mean that's that's in a way it can be more difficult i don't i don't know that there's one that would be better than another as far as the practice to it. Um, but you know, what I always come back to with, with uh, creating anything and with people asking questions about this or that or this or that is it, it, it usually just comes down to a personal preference. I mean, I would never tell someone to paint abstractly or non-representationally if they just didn't have the fire to do it. You know, and the same with anything academically, you know, if, if if you don't really want to do that and don't have a pension for doing that, then by all means, don't do it. Um, I, I kind of, I mentioned um, Harvey Dunn was an old illustrator. Uh, he was from North Dakota, I think, initially, but he studied with Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth and Jesse Wilcox Smith and all those painters and whatnot. But he said something once that has always stuck with me. Um, he was, he was, uh, someone came to him and said, hey, do you want to donate money to help fund this educational program for the arts or whatnot, you know, help struggling artists type of thing? And he said, nope, nope, sorry, don't, not going to do that. And and they were a little taken aback, you know, like, well, don't you believe in supporting artists? 
And he said, no, no, I don't. He said, I believe in discouraging them all I can because the real ones, you can't encourage. I always thought, huh, I, I, that's interesting. You know, I thought, do I believe that? Do I understand that? And the more I've thought about it, I, I think I, I, I understand where he's getting from. I mean, that's not to say if someone loves creating or painting or drawing or, or taking photographs or whatever, do it. But if you want to make it a career, think twice, think three times, if not four times. I mean, I can understand his viewpoint of I can save you a whole lot of misery and heartache and headache and, and stress. And I can save you a lot of that by telling you, just go do something else. I mean, honestly. <laughs> and, and, and I say that because I've had experience with that. You know, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, well, what about this? And teach me this or this and that. And, and I'll try initially. And then that's the end of that, you know, they move on or whatever, but there has been on occasion, uh, few and far between, you know, people that continue to come back. And those are the ones you can't discourage. So if you want to do it as a hobby and you love doing it and even selling a little bit or whatever, by all means, but if you want to make it a career, you better really think about what that entails. And what I mean by that is it's, it's more, I think personally, it's more of the lifestyle than what you create. So you you have got to understand the lifestyle of an artist and you have to be committed to that 100%. If not, then don't go down that path. I went to school with a lot of people that were a lot more talented than I am or ever will be probably, but they don't create anything in the arts because they couldn't commit to that lifestyle. And if you want to ask questions about the lifestyle, I'll gladly tell you about the lifestyle and then you can decide if that's something you want to do but i don't know maybe i got off off the track there but that's something that's important to me um i just wanted to say something real quick to her question um one of the things that i did because i did abstract figurative work initially before i went to what i'm doing now and one of the things that i did was blind drawing as an exercise and if anyone's not ever done that you know you just shut up set up a, a piece of paper and then on a table and you put something above it so you can't see what you're doing and you just make marks and you just keep doing that and then set it aside grab another piece of paper don't even look at it set it aside grab another piece of paper make marks and then do that multiple times and then pull them, you know, then look at them and see what happens. And that can inform you about making a switch from representational to abstraction. If, if as John says, if that's what you really want to do, and I will reiterate that it is, this is a hard path to follow and to be committed to, especially if you want to make a family and if you want to have a life outside of the studio it is really hard and think 10 times about it before you go into it because it is a serious, it, it's more of a commitment than a marriage. I agree. Good, 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 Anna. That was spot on. And I love the thing about the drawing that you mentioned. I'm sitting there thinking, well, that's exactly how I paint my paintings. I don't look at them. <laughs> I actually take my oil sticks with my left hand and close my eyes and just say, okay, where's this going? Uh, Gudrun has a question. Gudrun, you're muted. Yes, <laughs> thanks. So thanks a lot for this nice presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I have a, I'm a ph photographer, so I am not a painter. I have a question. I've seen your transition from landscape to, to the abstract. In the beginning, the abstracts had a lot of uh, landscape. And later, you've put a lot of symbols into your abstracts. How, what is the meaning of the symbols? How do they get into your work? Because it's different from uh, this painting of uh, what I would call a painting. Then I see symbols. How do, do they get into your head and into your work? 
And do they have a meaning or do they come into you somehow? Uh, yes, this is my question. Great question. Um, it's, it's a little of both. Uh, some, some things over time I've begun to realize keep cropping up in my work. And so some of the marks and symbols and I've begun to understand them and where they come from. And I will continue to use those. And then others are completely random and, and I don't know where they come from. And, and sometimes they have no meaning to me, but other people find meaning in them, which I think any great art, whether it's painting, drawing, photography, sculpture, or whatever, I mean, the viewer is the one that completes the piece. You know, the viewer brings their, their history and their emotion and their viewpoint to it. So I'm always hesitant in trying to describe exactly what's in my work or what certain things mean. And a lot of times I have no idea. Other times I do, but I'm still hesitant in saying, well, this is because of this, because that's my story. You know, that's my part of creating it. And, and I think the most successful pieces are the ones where the viewer will then complete it for themselves. And hopefully that is an ongoing dialogue that they have with the piece you know, all the time or every time they look at it, it becomes something else or could have a different meaning. That to me is a very successful painting. So yeah, it's it's both ways. Um, there are symbols. I mean, I'm looking at pieces that I have against the wall right now, and there are certain things in there that mean things to me, and there's others that I can't interpret. And I'll give you, I'll give you a quick, really quick story on this. Um, back in 2017, I had a gallery and the owner, um, the owner became very heavy handed with what she wanted done and what she expected of me and what I could and could not do. And that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I felt mm, I was a little irritated about this. And this was leading up to a, a, a solo show that I was going to have. And so when I was creating works for this solo show, what I found I ended up doing, and I don't think I really did this consciously, but after the fact, when I had the body of work done, I could see what I did, is I was creating work that had symbols and elements in it of um, like a circus in a carnival and like a puppeteer. And, and when I started understanding that in those pieces, I realized that I was putting my emotions of being treated like a puppet or a circus act, I was putting those emotions into these pieces and they really weren't very flattering for um, the gallery owner in the show that we were having, but it meant something special to me. And we hung all those paintings and, and I remember walking through before the opening and it was all I could do to, to keep from just chuckling and laughing because no one understood what I had done, you know, especially the gallery owner you know, I was poking fun at her and what she was trying to do to me through through paint. And uh, <laughs> I still think about it and chuckle. I and mean, she doesn't have a clue. And we actually parted ways shortly thereafter. But that's a different story. But I took a lot of those symbols and those emotions from that and realized that I love that aspect of it because I feel in my own life and I feel in, in everything that goes on around me that so much of it feels like a circus and a carnival and a fair. And, you know, so there are a lot of elements in my work that have that. And uh, there's a levity to it. You know, to me, it can be kind of humorous. Um, but also in my work, there's always a, a, a little bit of a darker element in a side to that that I really don't share with a lot of people about that. I, I get a lot of feedback in your work like, oh, it, it's so happy and it's so fun and, and this and that. And, I'm, and I think, great, you know, I'm glad that those elements and, and, and those things attribute to you feeling that way. But it's not always, you know, cotton candy and Ferris wheels. It's always a little bit of a, to me, there's some elements in there that are a little darker. Hopefully that answers and on the symbols. Thank you. Um, I have another question. <clears throat> um, years ago, I, I saw an Anselm Kiefer show at a museum, and like one piece was like six foot by eight foot. And the, the thought that struck me is like, 
you have to be incredibly confident in your ability to, to confront a blank canvas that large and to commit yourself to it. I know you talked about being terrified or, you know, kind of unsure of when you approach a blank canvas, but there's got to be a certain level of confidence. I mean, you've been doing this for 30 years. So, I mean, is it a mixture of confidence and uncertainty or anxiety, if those are the right words, or can you speak to that at all? Um, confidence. Uh, uh, the only thing I'm confident about is that uh, uh, I'll figure it out. You know, I, I usually will think that, and especially if, if the if painting is very frustrating or there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to it. You know, the only thing I'm confident in is I'll probably figure it out. And if not, I'll throw the damn thing away and, and start over. And I, I don't know, you know, part of that, part of that, Alan, is, is I, I also try to tell myself from time to time, from time to time, it makes no difference what I paint. I'll tell myself that it makes no difference what I paint, you know, because some people may hate it. Others may love it. Others don't care one way or the other. It makes no difference what I create. So just create something, you know, and that can be freeing in a, in a way. I think that does give me a bit of confidence doesn't matter. Don't get so tied up into thinking you got to create some great thing or whatever. Just do the work, you know, figure, figure that out. Appreciate that answer. Yeah. Um, Anne has another question. Well, I, I'm taking notes as we go here. And I was, I was really struck with this one phrase that I think really really makes this thing work as a photographer. And partly because, you know, I was a career educator. So a lot of times I'm asked to, how do you, you know, how do you do it? And, um, and especially in photography, you know, we're out looking for stuff to take pictures of. <laughs> but with abstract photography, that's not what you're doing at all. I mean, I don't, I even wrote this thing as I don't take pictures of stuff. And it's, it was impossible to sort of share, you know, a process or, or what are you doing? And people that are pretty much what I call traditional photographers, landscapes, stuff. And they go, oh, I'd love to go on a photo shoot with you. I'm like, Oh, uh, no, you wouldn't. And in fact, I even told my one roommate, I said, no, nope, you're not coming. And I think they were kind of offended because I said, I am. And what you said was you understand the lifestyle and you're committed to it. When you find something you can commit to or you, you see, like with us, we see an image and chase it down and, and then develop it and, and all these other things was not really something you can teach or share because it's yours. And to, to try to encourage these other people to do abstract stuff, it's like you are going to have to dig into yourself and then commit to the vision that you have and then run around after it. Because I said, you are not going to want to. I was in Chicago and I'm like, I'm going to go down where the L passes over on this you know, old grassy creek crap, you know and climb around and probably get scratched up and full of burrs and, and meet a bunch of drunks. I mean, it wasn't anything <laughs> that was terribly appetizing. But, you know, I said, when I see it, I, I, I capture it, you know, or, or the commitment to, I have a vision of something out here. And you really put into words what I keep saying, what the hell am I doing? And why is it I can't quite share this with anybody? Well, you kind of can't. You know, if you really are the artist, it's your work. It's it's what you are willing to commit to, and it's got to be, you know, uh, authentic for you. And so when I do these different presentations, I just go, well, you need to figure this out yourself, or you you teach them how to to do things, like you said, like put on some music or something, as sort of a uh, you know a platform to jump off of maybe, or to clear away other things that might distract. 
but I really appreciate what you said. You understand the lifestyle and you stay committed to it because that's, you know, the more you dig into the thing, you'll find what you wanted in it and then bring it out. And, and you know, again, photographers are always kind of, what do you create? You know, which again, you have to not listen to those voices either. I said, fuck it. You know, I'm, a, I'm not a photographer. I'm an art photographer, which is an important distinction. And, you know, we discussed this in our other photography group too. It's like, no, if you're an artist, it doesn't really matter what you have in your hands to make the art. You know, if it's a paintbrush or the camera, and, you know, you, you train yourself not to think, I am not a photographer, per se. So anyway, I really appreciate what you said. And it's fun to, to listen to all this stuff and see it in action. And, uh, you know, it's very affirming. I appreciate it very much. Good. I'm, I'm glad. It, it, um, I tried to quit many times <laughs> over the years. I mean, honestly, there that point, that transition point when I left illustration and, and began to figure out painting and what I wanted to paint. I mean, those are some of the uh, toughest, most worst times I've ever had. And yeah, I wanted to quit many times. I tried to quit many times. I tried to do two or three different things and, and none of them took. And I knew even starting them, it was stupid to even start them because it's not where my heart was. It wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And luckily, knock on wood, I mean, I have a wife that would just shake her head and think, just knock it off and get back in the studio. You know, we'll figure it out. You'll figure it out kind of thing. And so I can't, it's not all on me. I mean, I think if you have a partner or something, um, that makes a big difference as well. I mean, if they don't support you and they're not, they don't, if they don't buy into the lifestyle, then that can be, that can be a big struggle. And as far as the how do you do? How do you do things? How do you do that? I mean, like you mentioned, Dan, I don't, you, you do have to just kind of, how do I say this? I mean, you can teach someone basic design elements. You can teach that to them, but that doesn't mean that they're going to understand it or be able to use it properly, or maybe even know how to break the rules to it and do something completely different, which would probably be better anyway. So to me, it's almost like you can teach someone that, but I don't know if you're doing them any favor. You may be hindering them more than you're helping them, but it's hard to say, well, just go figure it out yourself. But nine times out of 10, that's when you figure out if this is really for you or not. And, and back to that same illustrator, Harvey Dunn, that you know told people he discourages artists. Um, they asked him about composition. You know, What are your thoughts on composition? And he, he looked at him and said, you either have it or you don't. There's no discussion on composition. You either know how to compose something or you don't. It's a gut feeling. I can't teach you composition. And, and that was always, you know, that made me think as well. There's a lot of things you can't teach. I can't, you know, I, we can talk about it and maybe we understand what we're talking about, but putting that into practice and doing it, that's where I think, that's where I think it comes down to, and I, and I hate saying this because on, on one hand, I think anyone can create and anyone, if they really, really, you know, the whole thing we've talked about, they can, you can do it. But on the other hand, there is this intangible that I'm sorry, if you don't have it, whatever that is, commitment or whatever, you're only going to get so far. I don't know. That's sort of the harsh, but... Well, but what you also said is about, you know, when you have a background in something, if you kind of know the rules, then then you really know how to break them. I mean, which, you know, as a teacher, I was I taught English and history and stuff, but I would say, well, these people get away with, you know, these these mutant sentences and, and whatnot because they understand what everybody is looking for. And I said, and you can do this badly. And I'll just say, God, you know, you didn't make a point or you didn't, uh, you know, it's just kind of, you know, you know, you're not Jackson Pollock if you just kind of throw paint at a canvas. So, yeah, it's, it's very intangible. And so I'm telling him, so learn the rules, then break them. <laughs> or, yeah, it's, or It's a matter of, um, it's a matter of 
figuring out, like I mentioned earlier, figuring it out, what about, what is it about, about you that's unique and different? And, and I always refer back, I always think back to, you know, think of filmmakers that you absolutely love. Like I love the Coen brothers and all the movies they create because they have a slightly different bent on things and they film things and they frame things and whatever. Okay. So from filmmakers to, uh, to photographers, to um, singers, I mean, music, you talk about it to me, it's like, okay, I'm not saying someone can sing better than another, but what I'm saying is when you, when I personally think about artists, musical artists that I love, it's because there's something unique and different about what they do or their voice, you know, the actual voice inflections or how they sing or whatever, you know, there's a uniqueness to that. They don't sound like everybody else. And, and I think that's what always will set people apart in the creative field is you don't look like uh, someone, you know, your work doesn't look like everybody else's, you know, you don't sing like everybody else's, you don't dance like every, it's those things I think. And so in the painting world, it's it's very easy to look like everyone else and to create work like everyone else or to throw paint on a canvas like everyone else or, or whatever. But it's it's taking that leap, that really that leap of faith into what is it about me? Because there's got to be something unique about every single one of us. You know, what is it that I can actually figure out and, and, and get it out there that's going to, to separate me? Well, I think on that note, we're kind of reaching the end of our talk and a Q&A session. So um, I want to thank everybody for being here and John, especially you, I appreciate you stepping forward and sharing not only about your work, but yourself. You know, uh, I really got a lot out of it. So I, I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Alan. And, and just as a, as a leaving thing, um, I'm always accessible. Anyone can email me, call me, whatever. I'm, I, I, I like that. I enjoy that. I got no problem with that. So if anyone has any follow-up things or they want to tell me my work stinks, go ahead, send it my way. I'm ready. <laughs> I, I think that's one of the things that we've, we've liked about this is that we all, and, and some of us do communicate back and forth after we do these. So we encourage that. That's the kind of the whole point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks, is, John. Really is there, a, Alan, is there a way that, that you can see the comments after the fact i say uh, them i'll send them to you in the chat okay great yeah. thank you yeah so. okay thanks thanks john so much it was, it was great really john. wonderful